Bloody hell. Bloody hell. Bloody hell. You guys have had quite a few weeks. Oh boy. Yeah. yeah. What is going on? So, so does everyone aware of, of these, these guys and their wear? You've all seen Terrifier? Are you all excited for Terrifier 2? Yeah, you are. Oh, someone's horny. I'm going to throw it out to the audience really quickly because I'm guessing there's a lot of questions from you guys. Tony Enshaw with the Rover mic, but let's get it started. Damien Leone, what did you cook up in that brain of yours to bring this shit to life? Oh my God. This is what happens when your mother names you after the omen. Yeah. Um, I mean, listen, I, um, first of all, it is such a pleasure to be here. This is our first time in the UK and uh, yeah, you guys are so lovely, so nice, um, and we've been friendly with a lot of you out here for, for years. I mean, Terrafari came out in 2016 or so, so it's so great to finally be here and to meet you guys. This is amazing, such a great experience. Um, but yeah, my God, I created this character a long time ago, back in 2005, I think. He was just in the opening of my first short film for like two minutes. And then the, um, the short shifts over to uh, demons and a satanic cult and all these other creatures. And everybody who saw that short film was like, dude, the demons are cool, you're creatures and everything, but that fucking clown at the beginning is insane. He looks so cool, he's so creepy. You have to keep making more things with that character. And you know, I got that note across the board, so it's just a no-brainer to keep going, keep exploring, and then I turned art into a uh, slasher, and then I really started developing his sick sense of humor, and that's when I realized there was, there was something cool with this character. And then, as you know, years later, when I finally got to make Terrifier, we hired this guy to be Art the Clown, and the rest is history. You're, one of, you're probably one of the nicest people I've ever met in real life. And then, this thing. What goes into bringing art to life? Uh, being bullied in middle school. <laughs> yeah, a lot of angst built up over all those years. I get to finally get it out. I'm like, yeah, I just pretend it's all those people. Yeah. No, it's, it's just fun. It's pure joy. I love the guy. He's such a mischievous little scamp. Yeah, mischief. I, I would go with mischievous little scamp. How was your interaction with art when he was a mischievous little scamp with you? Oh my God. Um... I, the, fir the one night I remember in the first movie was when uh, I'm pretty sure you were wearing the the prosthetic. My, yeah, my, yeah, my yeah. buffalo the cat bill lady. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, cat lady. Um, my so moves. I actually met you half naked. I mean, you were half naked. I wasn't half naked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a very cold night. Um, but no, it's it's been a joy and a pleasure. They're both geniuses, and everyone always asks, "Is it scary when you're filming?" And I said, "I have the." best time like we all have a lot of fun we have videos that Damien will never let us release just because they would ruin the, cl <laughs> the illusion the of illusion. Art the Clown when he's singing Adele or whatever just the <laughs> <laughs> hello <laughs> it's me and um, we're gonna straight to the audience first question please hi there um, I was wondering was Art the Clown always intended to be silent and if not what voice would you do Where's this voice coming from? <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's a Scottish person oh, okay. over here. I'm just like... <laughs> no, no, what, um, what? Yeah, he, yeah, he was always intended yeah. to be silent, for sure. Um, I always gravitated more toward the silent slashers. Um, not to say I don't love Freddy. Freddy's one of my favorite characters of all time. But there's just something a little creepier to me when you can't speak to the, uh, to the killer. You kind of can't rationalize with them. There's that communication is shut off, they're a little more animal. So I like that, plus I wanted art to be as far away from Tim Curry's Pennywise as possible. 
Um, so yeah, and plus I didn't have to write any dialogue, which really helped. And I didn't have to memorize any dialogue, <laughs> which is even more wonderful. So I never, I never imagined what he would sound like, but I know Dave does. <laughs> I, I just think it would be funny if he had like a posh accent or something like that. It's like, oh yes, hello there. You're going to die now. I'm gonna cut you in half. It's gonna be jolly good fun. <laughs> Um, lady in the front row. Uh, my favourite part in the first one is when Oz riding on his little tricycle, and I was wondering what all of your favourite parts of the movie were. That was the hardest I laughed during that entire shoot. Oh, but him trying to learn how to ride that, because he's pretty tall, that thing was so small, his clown shoes are so big, and he just kept crashing and falling. And uh, I just kept the camera rolling, and I was just laughing and just making him ride around in circles. And he was singing uh, Bicycle Race by Queen the entire time. Oh, yeah, As yeah, yeah. Herbert the Pervert from like uh, Family I Guy. That. He was like, I want to ride my bicycle. Sorry, my voice is a little shot right now, so it doesn't work as well, but. <laughs> hey there, Muslims. Yeah. <laughs> Get your fat ass over here, Victoria. Mmm, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> I do remember that. I remember that night. There's many videos. Well, that was. Um, that was the hardest I laughed during the shoot, but my mo I think the most fun was shooting the pizzeria scene. Just because it was very, it was cozy, we had heat finally, we had free pizza, um, there was no blood, so that was, you know. Well, there was later on. Well, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. But. Oops. Hello. Hi, guys. Um, I wanted to know, what was your process, uh, inspiration, in coming up with the kill scenes? Because um, to me, I imagine a bunch of kids sitting around trying to gross each other out, and the one who has the most disgusting idea wins. Yeah. <laughs> was that what happened? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, listen, when, when I was getting ready to make Terrifier, I knew it was going to be so low budget. Um, we had like $35,000 to start shooting the movie, and I said, why is somebody going to watch this movie when they can go watch a $50 million Hollywood horror film? And I said, we have to show the audience things that they would never have the balls to show. And, uh, and I said, listen, I've been watching slasher films since I'm three, four years old, and I've seen a lot of stuff. So I'm like, what can I show people that I haven't seen that would really get my attention? And I started researching medieval torture methods, and I came across this actual method of murder where they would hang the person upside down and they would saw them in half. And because the blood was draining to you know, your lower extremities and whatnot, and you weren't hitting any vital organs quickly, the person was alive and suffering, supposedly, for quite some time. And I said, that is the most disturbing thing I've ever seen. And if we could pull that off and actually show all of that where other movies would cut away or they would just, you know, I said, that would really potentially get people talking. And it did. I mean, that's the scene that everybody talks about now when they bring up Terrifier 1. I remember, as you said, talking about the release of the first film, I remember I was uh, hosting a convention years ago, and there was a guy dressed as art, and I was like, who's this clown? And they're like, well, not, yeah, yeah, no, he looks, he looks really, hey, there you go, there's a bit of a smile. And someone said, oh, this is movie, it's terrifying. I was like, I'm not sure that I've heard of it yet. The first thing they said was, he cut a girl in half <laughs> through that, with a hacksaw, and I'm like, oh! Worst gynecology exam ever. Oh. Hello. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to say I think I can speak for everyone here and say how excited we are for Terrifier 2. Oh, we are so you. excited. <laughs> thank you. Um, obviously, all we're seeing about it is people puking, fainting, walking <laughs> out. Is that something that you're proud of? Did you want to achieve that reaction from the crowd? <laughs> oh, sick yeah, bags yeah, ready. Here are the bar bags. Look at this. Um, well, we're very excited for you guys to see it, uh, and we know it's been a really long wait. Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a badge of honor, especially because a lot of people think that, you know, we started that, and it's sort of a marketing ploy, and I swear on the success of the movie that it is genuine. People, not many people, but a few actually did get sick. I mean, I know a couple of people who were in theaters and witnessed the, some guy pass out while he was watching it. So, I mean, listen, it is a very extreme, unrated movie. It's two hours and 18 minutes long. I mean, everything about it is really unprecedented, I mean, in the States. You don't typically see that. Uh, an unrated movie playing in legit theaters. Um, and listen, there's one kill scene, because it was like, now how do we rival 
the hacksaw scene, because that's what everybody talks about in part one. Where are you going to go? How are you, where are you going to go from there? So there is a scene in particular. I mean, there's many scenes, but there's one in particular in part two that goes on for like three minutes. And I know that's the scene that's making some people a little woozy, so to speak. I think it's longer than three minutes. <laughs> it might be longer. It, it than felt longer. <laughs> that, oh, my, I, I, has anyone seen the second one yet? So I saw yeah, it at yeah. Fright Fest in London. Um, and these vomit bags, you might have seen them go viral a while ago. We're the northern premiere of the Dead of Night Film Festival from Liverpool Horror Club. Katie, give us a wave. Yeah. Woo. And they brought out the, the vomit bags, and, and to be fair, it's probably needed because yeah, yeah. it's that, that it's was great because that started obviously before it hit theaters in the States. So that was like a cool gimmick because you knew the movie was sick, but then people actually started throwing it up and fainting. But has that taken you by surprise? Or did you know making it? So I will say honestly, like I would joke around with them when we were shooting the movie. I said, you know, people are, are going to walk out of this death for sure. Because most people, some people would just walk in without even seeing part one and just be like, oh, it's this killer clown movie. And then not knowing what they're going to get into. I mean, but if you see Terrifier 1, you would know what you're getting into. But It, it ups uh, the ante. Yeah, and, but and, it, we up the ante, yeah. And, and obviously he... It, your, your face is, is different. <laughs> uh, yes, very different. And I think, I, without trying to sound like I'm, I'm sucking up too much, Terrifier 2, you sh- I know Lauren Levere is incredible, and her performance of Sienna is incredible. It, honestly, horror's got a new final girl. She's amazing. Yeah. But your physicality, your performance, there's such a dark comedy to the way you do it, and you're doing some nasty shit. But your body language, your performance, it's just magic. Thank you. What was different for Terrifier 2? Did you feel it when you were making it? I, I, I did. I, I think um, both myself and Art are a lot more confident this time around. I don't like how you've said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, yeah. Has he got a life of his own? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think he's a lot more uh, cocky this time around because he's like, he came back from the dead. He, he did, yeah. Now he's like, oh, cool. Now I got more powers than I thought. I'm hard to kill. I'm gonna have a lot more fun. Tony. Hi, I have a question for David and David Howard and Damien Leo. My question is, was a knife always a possibility of, uh, as a weapon or would Art like to use any other weapon to kill people with? Oh yeah, I, I see Art as kind of like a MacGyver character with uh, weapons. He, he, he uses whatever he finds around him and he sometimes just makes his own crazy things. Like my, my favorite weapon of his that we even bring into part two again is his uh, Cat of Nine Tails flail because it has all those blades on it which is pretty sick enough. But one thing people don't realize, all the ropes on there, that's not rope. That's hair from his victims. So he's like woven their hair into this rope. So it's like, it's like his own little trophies in a way. So I think that's so messed up. That's one of my favorite weapons he has. But he has some fun ones in part two. Yeah. I mean, I like having him use a good old fashioned butcher knife as well. Uh, he uses it in part two a couple of times. Um, but the, um, the trick is to do it in a way, like take all those classic weapons or classic tropes and then just try and put a, a bit of a spin on it where you know, classically, you might just see the knife go up, comes down, person's dead, scene's over, but you put that knife in Art's hands and it turns into a four minute kill scene, you know what I mean? Where he's just relentless and stabbing people in places you don't typically see or things like that. So. How, much, how much leeway do you give David with, with stuff like that? Do you, obviously, you, you write the, the script that's on the page, you've got it in front of you, but yeah. is there a collaboration in the performance? Oh, I got two questions over here. Hi guys, it's me again. How are we all doing? Hey, what's up, buddy? Lovely to meet you all. Um, first question I'd like to ask is, what was the kill in the first Terrify film that made you a bit squeamish, if you know what I mean? Oh, I, I don't get squeamish uh, looking at what I create. I get squeamish looking at real things, though, believe it or not, which surprises people. I don't like actual violence or things like that. Um, what did, there was actually, for Terrifier 2, the big kill scene, when I was editing that, and I was listening to the actor scream for like four hours straight while I was cutting it, with no music or anything, uh, it really made me lightheaded for a second. I remember calling him up and saying like, wow, man, I was just cutting that scene and I actually got a little uh, 
nauseous. And I was like, if that's happening now, I think it's going to be really effective, you know, when the audience sees it. Um, so, yeah, but when, I mean, you know, I build all these things, so I don't really look at it that way. But hearing somebody actually scream is a little disturbing. And for yourself? I, um, I, I really don't get squeamish either. But I, 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 I guess it's because I see how the, you know, the, the cake is made, so it doesn't really bother me as much. But I, I really liked also the decapitation scene of the exterminator in the first one. I thought that was a really well done decapitation. A lot of blood, a lot of fun. I feel like I'm making up for both of them. I get massively squeamish. I don't even think I've seen the whole film in its entirety because I've covered my, ma- my eyes the whole time. But uh, I feel like when his head was getting, Mike, it was Mike, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, getting his head cut off in the first one, but pretty much every kill scene that you've <laughs> just made me want to vomit. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I'm just in the background. Um, hi, everyone. Um, just, wanted to, uh, just wanted to know, this is one for each one of you, I suppose. Um, who are your biggest inspirations? So as a director, producer, as a, an actor, actress, who are your biggest inspirations that you take from in the history of horror? Um, I have a lot of inspirations, especially for art, because I pulled from a lot of my, my favorite um, comedic actors. So I, I, I have a love of like silent film era comedies. So like Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harpo Marx. Then I, I brought it up to modern times like Jim Carrey, Doug Jones, Rowan Atkinson. Um, gosh, so many. Uh, Andy Serkis. Also um, my, my good buddy, Stefan Carl, who was uh, Robbie Rotten on the show Lazy Town. I was his understudy for five years with How the Grinch Stole Christmas the Musical. And he was a master at physical comedy. And so when I, I took on the role of art, I called him up and I'm like, Stefan, I'm about to play this character that's silent. Can you give me some tips? And he did. And so I would have several moments on the set where I'm like, how would Stefan approach this scene? And then I'm like, okay, I know exactly what to do here. So that, that's where I got my inspiration from. I remember the first time I, I interviewed you for the, for the Love of Horror podcast a few years ago, and I said, what's your inspiration for art? And you said, Stefan Carl, and I was like, Robbie Rotten from Lazy Town. And yeah. then when you, when you described it, I totally get it. It's physicality, it's big over the top it's performance. It's very, very, very animated. It, it, you can go back and watch a lot of Lazy Town episodes and see a lot of Robbie Rotten and Art the Clown. And what I noticed was a lovely touch was uh, I'm one of those people that stays right to the end of the credits of everything. You put in a dedication in his memory, didn't you? I yes. Th- yeah, and it's, I, I see, as we were walking out, I was like, no way. I shot you a message on Instagram. I was like, I can't believe that. It's yeah. a lovely touch. Can we have a big round of applause? Thank you. Um, so... I would say, and he was supposed to be here this week, and my biggest inspiration is uh, Tom Savini, special makeup effects artist. We all know Tom Savini, right? So when I was a kid, I discovered uh, the VHS tape Scream Greats, which showcases all his effects, and it was the first time I saw somebody who creates the monsters that I already grew up loving. So when I saw him with the Jason dummy from Friday 13 Part 4 and Fluffy from Creepshow, it was like a big light bulb moment. And uh, when I got into special effects around the age of 12, that's when I really started getting into filmmaking as a whole, you know, because doing those special effects, they don't work unless they're, you know, they're camera illusions. So then when I started filming them with the camera, then it became developing stories to showcase these special effects and things like that. But in terms of uh, filmmaking, so many inspirations. I mean, the, all your usual suspects, but the first filmmaker where I noticed in an identifiable style was Martin Scorsese where you could just watch his movies and just see his signature film te- you know techniques and the way he moves the camera and his swish pans and like fast zooms and jump cuts and freeze frames I was like oh wow like the you know a director could really put his stamp on a film you could see him almost starring in it um, so Scorsese has always been a huge uh, inspiration so gimme shelter drops in terrifier yeah. 3 we know yeah. why <laughs> exactly Samantha Oh, I feel like I'm... I actually watched Rosemary's Baby for the first uh, first time in a long time, and that was something that I, across the board, from script to direction to acting, that just kind of always is just... It's like kind of perfection to me. Um, but I think your usual sp- suspects, like the Scream franchise, I mean, The Exorcist. Uh, I love Sigourney Weaver and Alien. I think she's like fucking... 
badass. Um, so many, so many, but yeah. Hello. Oh, it's, it's you. It's me, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a two-parter. Firstly, um, and apologies if this, any, any of this gets answered in Terrified 2, but if there is more art, and I'm sure we'd all love there to be, do you plan on introducing any backstory? And would you, or could you look at bringing in some of the, um, the elements from All Hallows' Eve? Well, he is, um, he was pretty supernatural in All Hallows' Eve, and as you know now, at the end of Terrifier, he is blatantly supernatural. He comes back from the dead. Um, it's, I mean, I recommend everybody see Terrifier 2. Maybe we um, answer some questions, or maybe some new ones come up. But in terms of Art's backstory, it's always, I'm always trying to walk a fine line because I think the mystique is very uh, important to the character. And I think if you reveal too much, or you show the wizard behind the curtain, that illusion is destroyed, it's over. And it's gonna be hard to live up to the expectations of what you're creating in your mind of what he can be. But I also think it's my job as a screenwriter to be somewhat creative and give you enough information where you also feel satisfied at the same time. First of all, thank you for being legends and being awesome. Um, I was wanting to know, hi, I'm here, hi, <laughs> so I'm tiny, um, I, was, I was wanting to know, now the outtakes, because we was watching Terrifier again in the hotel last night, and we were saying how cool it would be for the outtakes, if they're available to see, like anything, because that'd be so cool. Like all the funny outtakes, like you said about the bike. Yeah. Like, where do we watch that? You know what it is? Anything funny that happens in the outtakes, I usually put them in the movie. So, like, him crashing was an outtake when he's riding the bike. Him giving her the finger was an outtake. Like, I yelled cut, and the camera was still rolling, and she was walking back over to Dave, and he gave her the finger. And everybody laughed on set. I didn't think twice about it. And then when I went back, and I was editing the footage, and I saw the raw footage of that, and everybody laughing, I was like, hmm. I was like, if that got a laugh on set, maybe it'll get a laugh in the movie. I was like, it was nothing I would ever write for Art the Clown to give somebody the finger. It's just like so, almost like desperate for a laugh or so on the nose, but it was also very organic and natural. So I said, you know what? At this point in the movie, it could use a little bit of levity and maybe that'll, maybe that'll work. And it did, I mean, it gets a laugh, so. Yeah. And yesterday, when you'd done the makeup for the photo op, you walked out onto the balcony there, <laughs> waved to everyone and then just went, Bang. <laughs> it's incredible. Did everyone get their photo with David yesterday in the costume? Thank you, guys. He suffers for his art. <laughs> ha, Tony Earnshaw. Hello. Hi, Sam. Um, in two, I was delighted to finally see a bit more of what's in Art's trash bag. What else is in there? Does he have snacks in there? Does he have a oh. change of little yeah. hat? What else is in the bag oh, yeah. that we didn't see? Definitely some snacks, I like to think. He's got, you know, got some, like, you know, maybe a kid's meal, maybe some lady fingers, some head cheese, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's his, it's, his bag of tricks is such a... Spotted dick. It's such a benefit. <laughs> it's pretty terrible. Because, wait, in all these movies, the killer kind of has to, either has a signature weapon or they have to keep finding new weapons. And that's such a burden, so when I was writing the character, I said, I'm just gonna give him this giant bag and he could pull whatever he wants out of it at any time, basically, so. Yeah. Tony Anshaw at the back. Oh, hi guys, you all right? Um, thanks very much for coming over. It was an absolute game changer when you guys were announced last year and it's been awesome to meet you today. Uh, um, likewise. I just wanted to say, a lot of the m mainstream news outlets seem to be thinking, uh, praising the, uh, the PR team for Terrifier 2. Um, but the PR team is the movie and how crazy it is and how gory it is. So I was just wondering, do you guys have a favorite kind of TV spot that's happened over the last week or two where these mainstream news outlets are talking about Terrifier 2 and by doing so, pushing the movie even further into um, you know, the, the, yeah. um, the mainstream? No, the two most amazing things that have happened this past week was uh, Stephen King tweeted about us and sort of praised the uh, practical gore in the movie. And uh, I think Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, I woke up and I checked my phone and it's all text messages from almost everybody I've ever 
met in my life saying, dude, Howard Stern is talking about you right now. And there was like a 20 minute segment, the opening segment of the Howard Stern show was them talking about Terrifier 2 and talking about it making people sick and fainting. And one of the um, guys who works with him on the show, uh, Richard Christie, is a huge Terrifier fan. Like he's literally one of us and he even did the Indiegogo campaign. And he was just the, being a total champion for this franchise on that show. And it was just the most amazing thing because I grew up loving Howard Stern since the 90s since I'm like 13, 14. And to hear Howard Stern say Art the Clown and say Terrifier, he's like, he's like, why? Ooh, he's like, I, I like that the fact that his name's Art. And like all these, th I'm like, oh my God, this is surreal. So that was amazing. Yeah, one that got me also is um, there's a show called The Talk. I didn't even know about this show at first. But like Jerry O'Connell, and uh, he he had seen he started talking about it on the show, and he said he and his wife Rebecca Romaine were gonna go see it, and they went to go see it, and they came back, and he was like going on and on and on and on and on about how much he loved the movie and everything, and I thought that was so cool because it's kind of full circle for me because my first slasher that I ever saw in the theaters was Scream 2, so I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing, this is so cool, so I was excited for that as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, to I second all of that, but I think the really cool stuff is when your friends are seeing stories of their friends and they're DMing you and you're like, holy shit, it's getting out like that far and wide that all of a sudden just friends of friends of friends of friends. So definitely Howard Stern, definitely Stephen King, but yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. We Walking out of the premiere in London, and obviously there's a couple of you guys that were there, the reaction was obviously, it sort of finished and everyone was just like, Holy shit, I cannot believe they're getting away with this. It was just, it's so, if, if Terrifier 1 is there, I was expecting Terrifier 2 about there, but you guys are, like you swung for the fences big time. Have you got plans for three? I do, I do, not to, yeah, for sure. And, and I, <laughs> the idea for three is becoming so big that there might be a four as well but uh yeah i mean i get and i didn't set out to make the movie as long so I, i'm not looking to make another two hour and 20 minute slasher but that just was the organic story that came out of me that i wanted to tell um but yeah i mean i have a whole treatment of where this story goes and especially where it ends which is the most important thing and which would be the most frightening thing because how do you end this whole you know like end the expectations where do you go where do you cap it off and I feel really cool about where, where it ends, which is rare, so. Uh. And it's, is it still in cinemas in America? Is this the third weekend now? It is. It was only supposed to play for one weekend, yeah. and it just keeps snowballing and doing better. And even if it plays in less theaters, it's been making more money. So uh, it's going into its fourth uh, weekend. Because I was looking at the box office statistics, it's gone up. Yeah. The, the, the cinema screenings have gone down. Yeah. And the money has gone up, yeah, yeah. which is insane. That never happens. It does not. No, that never happens. No, we're we're the fifth uh, highest grossing movie like yesterday in America. Like we we're, were number five. Ten, <laughs> and we've gone up to number five. Jesus, yeah, what the crazy. fuck? <laughs> and there's no. What's really unprecedented is there's no studio backing behind it whatsoever. No. Even your very low budget movies like Paranormal Activity or Blair Witch, eventually a huge studio picks them up yep. and puts you know a $20 million marketing campaign into them and it's released by whatever, Paramount or Warner Brothers or something. Like, n none of that. It's, it's just, just us. This is word of mouth. Yeah, it's just... And doing podcasts like you were on Talk is Jericho. Um, you were on a friend of mine, Brandon Crane, his new oh, podcast. He's the best. I listened to both of them. They're and incredible. Jericho, they're both incredible. I mean, and it's, love it's Jericho, that, isn't it? Pe yeah. People who've worked with you, people who know you're getting it out, and then pe people like these guys going, oh, yeah, that sounds good. It is. It's all word of mouth. Seriously, it's all you guys. This movie is all birthed from the fans, for real. So, Tony and yeah. Shaw. Yeah. Hiya. Yeah. Um, so obviously, I've not actually seen the second one yet, but it's had such a visceral reaction so far that it's already becoming in its own way iconic. Do you reckon it will reach the same iconicness as The Exorcist that had the same kind of reaction? Because I think it's getting there and it'll be the modern day version wow. of iconism. Yeah, I, listen, I don't like... Uh for my own work and things, I don't like throwing icon out there. I mean, if you guys throw that out there, that is the most amazing thing ever. So it would be a dream come true if in 20 years they talk about, you know, Terrifier 2 making people throw up and faint in the theaters. I would love that. 
Um, but it's not for me to say. I, 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 I mean, The Exorcist is technically the biggest horror film of all time. So that's, that's a fit. So, you know, right, no so pressure, Damien. Yeah, no no pressure. pressure, guys. Um, we've got we've got about ten minutes left. Smashing. Um, please throw your hands up for more questions. Hey. Hi. Um, so you were just talking about big studio involvement and how. Um, horror movies get picked up, would you ever do that and get involved with a big studio? Or is the success of Terrify and how it's been independent, is that going to be something that you stick with and stay independent so you can do exactly what you want? Yeah, I would do that for Terrifier. Um, even if a huge studio came in and gave me tons of money and then they said, though, but you have to change this, you can't do that. Like, I knew, I knew exactly what we had to do with Terrifier and what it needed to be in order for it to make this Splash, you know, and I didn't necessarily know it was going to do this that quickly and blow up in theaters. I didn't expect it to be playing in theaters, but I thought it. W I, I really thought we were going to deliver the goods, and I thought you guys were going to respond to it positively. But um, yeah, I would absolutely work for studios in a heartbeat and make but different movies. And sure, I mean, meet our ratings and things like that. Whatever you have to do, not every movie has to be terrifier and has to be that graphic, but. You know, that, that's a key element to what Terrifier is. And, yeah. Before we go to the next question, what slasher franchise would you guys like to take over? Uh, Friday, uh, Friday the 13th, in a heartbeat. Yeah, if I could, yeah. Ah, uh, boy. Um, I would say maybe Nightmare on Elm Street. I, I love that one. I've always just thought that's such a creative franchise. And for me, I still want, I want to see you as the Joker. Like full time. I've seen it. Uh, yes. Now that that is my dream role is to play the Joker. I, I want to do him right because I'm tired of Hollywood messing him up and making him. Can you stand up and show us your t-shirt, by the way? <laughs> Art the clown as the killing joke. The killing joke. <laughs> and what would you like? What, what? What? I mean, I know you said you didn't like the gore, but. I mean, I, lo I love doing it. It's, yeah. it's amazing. No, she I wanna... wants to do Barney and Friends. Don't let, her, don't let her fool you. When I put that prosthetic on her, the, the transformation that she goes through is one of the most amazing things to see. And she's one of the most fun people to be around. She literally goes insane and becomes Victoria in that makeup. Becomes an yes. outlet. It's, it's, it's an outlet. It's wild. This, this it's wild. Near the start of the second film with the talk show bit was just <laughs> yeah. so good. Yeah. Um, what's the, what are we? Hello. Guys, we've mentioned the three minute scene, so I'm not going to give any spoilers away. You can say it's only three minutes, but it's been living rent free in my head for a really, really long time. But my question would be with more budget, was there more pressure or potentially less fun? Or equally, if you had an unlimited budget, what would each of you like to see in the film? Yeah, man, I, I think this was the most pressure I ever felt. It wasn't so much about the money, it was just about the, the expectations and just art keeps, you know, his popularity just keeps growing and growing and we keep meeting all these wonderful people at horror conventions and everything. They just keep coming up to us with tattoos and things. And it's like, oh my God, like the last thing you want to do is let everybody down. So there's a lot of pressure in just making sure this was as good as we could make it. Um, and again, yeah, I mean, it was still, we had more money, but we still had such a small crew and this was like quadruple the amount of ambition compared to part one. So it was, you know, again, it almost took three years to make this movie because it was such a small crew and we did whatever we had to do to get the script to the screen, even if that meant taking years to do it, you know, and build whatever we had to build, whether it be a set or a big special effects set piece. So there was a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. Yeah. For me, it, yeah, if we had a, like a, a big budget for one of these one day, I. I would love to just do probably one of the biggest kill scenes ever in a horror movie. I would just like a one mass just slaughter that I, if we had that kind of money sure. to put into prosthetics, I think that would be so cool to do, but it's up to him. <laughs> um, I would like to see Damien get an assistant because I, <laughs> yes. I don't know if yes. you all know, Damien was wrote it, produced it, directed it, was doing the special effects, which takes about like three hours to do prior to even starting to direct. So I mean, like, what was your longest day, I think? Uh, 27 hours. Because <laughs> he's putting us into makeup, and, he's, and some days it was both of us, and then directing and then taking us out of makeup. So that was like, I mean, an assistant, yes. Several. 
He is the hardest working man in the industry, I think. <laughs> yes. Tony at the back. Hey guys, uh, thank you so much for being here, and it's just so incredible to have you here, so thank you. Um, so, as maybe part of a spin-off in the future, you referenced about Stephen King recently acknowledging Terrifier. Would you ever have a Pennywise versus Art the Clown? And if so, what fear could Pennywise use against Art the Clown? Ooh, I'm sure, why not? I would love to. I would love to see him go up against another uh one of the iconic slashers. Um, but what is, so Pennywise feeds on fear, fear yeah. so what would, what, I don't know. I don't know what uh, Art's, I do know what Art's afraid of. I can't say it yet. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it would be an easy contest, though. Art would just point at him and laugh. He's like, you got beaten by kids. He'd just start, you know, just ha. Because I thought he'd just beat him like that. Just like, yeah, you're a loser. I have a question over here. One of the things that I love about Terrifier is that it just is all practical effects, pretty much. Was that really important for you to do? And how the bloody hell did you do it where it looks really good? You can't even tell. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, always, because I grew up, like I said, idolizing Tom Savini, and I got into special effects makeup because of my love for practical gore more than anything else. So, and that's always been... Uh, to our advantage because I never we have like I said we've had such low budgets and I don't have to I don't pay myself to do the effects you know I just know what we can get the cheapest materials for and make the most of them and I could pretty much show whatever I want so and those are the things that stand out like the hacksaw scene so it just seems natural that we just keep going in that direction because we all love we could all tell the human eye could still tell if something's real um, as opposed to made in a computer, it still looks, especially with gore, it still looks very cartoony to a degree. So I'll keep doing the practicals for as long as I can. But I even, I do like digital effects sometimes when they augment the practicals. And we did that a few times in uh, Terrifier 2 and nobody could tell. And it, but when you use it uh, correctly, it's the most effective thing ever. So and when you both, don't use yeah. it well at all, it's the thing 2011. Uh, last question over there. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Thank you for existing again, I guess. Um, with the supernatural element kind of coming in, um, sometimes it can get quite silly. Like, have you got a solid idea of where it's going to go? Just because with some other horror movies, sometimes it can go quite, I don't know, goofy in some way. But I don't know. What's, what's your idea for it? Are you confident with that idea of it going into the supernatural element? Sure, um, I'm comfortable with it, but I knew writing part two that it was going to be the most polarizing aspect of the movie because it's so different. The first Terrifier is so grounded in reality until the, the ending. But in all these slasher franchises, other than Scream, where they just keep switching out the killer, I mean, the killer typically becomes supernatural. But most filmmakers and movies, they don't explore why. It ju it's just the trope. And filmmakers kind of like, well, that's what the boogeyman does. He comes back. But I wanted to sort of embrace that idea and really focus on it and explore why, what is this supernatural force that's guiding Art the Clown? What brought him back? Why? And if there's a supernatural evil in the world, in this universe, there should be a supernatural good as well, because how are you going to possibly combat supernatural evil? So I like where it's going. I like exploring that. I don't want that to overshadow the movie, but it's always going to be an element within it, as long as we're going in this direction. And that is all we've got time for. Terrifier 2 is out in the UK tomorrow on Blu-ray. Go out and buy it. Uh, thank Please you, everybody. Give a massive thank you so much.